So <clears throat> Paul talked about low temperature thermal and um, talked about passive solar thermal design. Um, solar thermal pool heating is something we'll get into a little bit more in the medium temperature range. Um, but in terms of a passive thing, you know, you can heat your swimming pool with a passive system. And we'll talk in the medium temperature section a little bit about heating pools with an active system. Um, but we're going to talk about high temperature collectors what we call concentrating solar thermal power. And as Jenna says, this is industrial level. This is not something you're gonna have in your backyard and probably for really good reasons because it would be way too dangerous. Um, with concentrating solar thermal, we're going to be able to achieve very high temperatures and those very high temperatures can be very effective in designing systems to generate electricity on a commercial scale. So <clears throat> concentrating solar power um, utilizing technologies to concentrate solar irradiance, sunlight, to increase thermal power production. So we know that that balloon got hot, but if we can concentrate the solar energy, we can get it a lot hotter. Probably hot enough to melt the balloon as that goes. Um, so we can use that in increasing heat to be able to generate electricity or do mechanical work as we'll see in these systems. So lots of sunlight comes to the earth, no question about that. Way more sunlight, uh, way more energy than we have any need for. So clearly the motivation is there to be able to take advantage of this solar energy. Um, you know that sunlight comes in a lot of different wavelengths. Um, we get infrared and we get the UV of course and some other frequencies beyond and above. Um, but we have a lot of infrared energy, heat energy, to be able to take advantage. So <clears throat> when we look at the uh, insulation map of the United States, you see, as you would expect, yeah, I guess it's working there a little bit, that most of our available solar energy is down in the southwest. Um, and so if you're looking to take advantage, maximum advantage of solar energy, that's certainly where you'd have to look. On the other hand, if you were part of our uh, solar photovoltaic program, then you're also aware that we can do solar, solar photovoltaics anywhere in the country. We get plenty of sunlight to be able to make effective use of solar panels, solar photovoltaic panels, even here in Pittsburgh, even though you see that it's got some of the worst um, insulation of anywhere in the country. These maps uh, have some very interesting things to tell us. Um, you'll notice that the one, uh, while we can talk about the southwest United States being an excellent place to put our solar collectors, um, we also recognize that when you're going to have a uh, insul installation which covers many acres, that if that installation can be flat, it's going to work a lot better. And so when you're looking at are these slope maps, huh? greater than 1% excludes greater than 1% slope and this excludes greater than 3% slope. So you're saying, where's the flat land out there? And so we're looking for truly flat areas. We're really looking at this map. If we then allow for perhaps something which is a little steeper, then you're looking at this map. Um, and then you say, well, what about all those other places? Well, remember too that there are places that you can't use because People are already living there, um, perhaps they're national parks. So when you start to look at what are the available spaces, then you start to see how it all kind of closes in. But the other important feature on this map are the green lines. And you can see that some of those lines are obviously the outlines of states, but what about the rest of them? The rest of them are power transmission lines. They are high um, voltage transmission lines that are already in place. So we can make the electricity out in the desert but that's not where people need it. So we have to be able to get it somewhere where they can take advantage of it. And so thinking about locating along any of these areas that are orange where they have a green line overlapping it would certainly be um, a place of maximum advantage. So when you think about where you're going to look for current installations or planned installations, that's probably where you're most likely to find them. Here we have the world view. And it says the uh, suitability for solar thermal power plants and the, the uh, orangish ones are excellent, but the um, ones here that are a little bit orangish yellow um, are good. And so we talk about excellent here in our country, and but if you go to the good part, you can spread that out a little bit further. 
Notice this huge area of northern Africa. Um, so we can talk about Egypt and Libya, uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Iraq as having really good spaces, but certainly a lot of those other countries in the northern half of Africa have good potential. Um, we can go over into Afghanistan, Pakistan, some northern India area over here. Australia, excellent. South America, down, I'm sorry, South America, let's point over there, huh? Down into the uh, Andes region in the high desert of that uh, area too. So lots of places in the world where this technology can have some effect. Now, take a look right here, because there's Spain. And later in the program, we're gonna talk about how Spain has invested in this type of technology. And, but notice the color. So even though Spain doesn't show up in the excellent or good, it still shows up in the suitable. And they've been able to take advantage of that in that country as well. Um, so now into the technology a little bit. Concentrating solar power um, can be thought of in four different forms. What we call the linear parabolic trough system, the linear Fresnel reflector system, the parabolic dish Stirling engine system, and then the power tower system. So we'll go through each of these systems, talk a little bit about how they work, and um, what would be an advantage of one perhaps over the other a little bit. So first of all, let's talk about linear collector systems. And when you talk about a linear collector, it's all based on the parabolic curve. So basic idea about a parabola, you guys want to incorporate math into your lesson, and how, you know, what, what determines mathematically what is the equation of a parabola, and to look at how that parabola then would have a focus. Um, and so what we're doing is designing this parabolic shape to have a focus of a particular point um, which is located slightly above the trough where we can put a collector pipe. And so all that heat is going to be focused on this pipe and we're going to be able to run some kind of a fluid through that pipe to absorb that heat and take that heat away to do something to produce electricity. Now, um, I don't know where you would be with your students in terms of how we make electricity. I hope you talk about that at some point. Um, you know, commercially, how do we make electricity? And what goes on even in the coal-fired power plant? You know, the fact that we're going to generate steam, we're going to have that steam turn a turbine. That turbine is going to spin that um, conduct the magnet inside the coil and we're going to generate electricity. So w what we're looking at in most of these systems is how can we spin that turbine? And in most of these systems, the turbine is still going to be turned by steam. So the idea then is how do I get the heat from this pipe to the turbine? What are we going to do to interconvert that? And there are different systems that we can talk about. We don't have to get into a lot of details about it. But fundamentally, the idea is to focus the energy, all of that heat, onto the pipe and have that heat absorbed. You can see a little bit here in this picture down here too, that you have a continuous mirror. And this trough, this, you know, the curved mirror, uh, you can see sits on an axis. And so you're going to design this system to run north-south uh, north, so that this thing can run from east to west and have a controlling mechanism to allow it to track the sun as it moves from east to west as it goes through the day. So you can keep the sun focused on that uh, pipe uh, all day long. But you'll notice that in this system, the entire unit tracks, doesn't it? The mirror and the pipe and everything has to track. So this is a good example of that. This uh, is a uh, model um, which we got from Flabeg, which is a company uh, which was manufacturing these mirrors in Pittsburgh, um, curiously enough, and then shipping them out west. Um, but you can pass that around, just get a sense of what that looks like. And then you can see that when you actually want to build a power plant like this, you would take many, many of these things and put them all together and they have to be connected somehow because obviously we've got only a central generator here where we're going to make the electricity and somehow all of this fluid has to circulate through all of this system back to the generator where we're going to be able to take that heat and convert it into steam to, to run the uh, turbine. So one of the 
big engineering challenges about this kind of a system is how do you make the connections as you go from one of these troughs to the next and you can see some pictures of how that's accomplished um, but those are um, connections which have to not leak at high temperatures and that was quite a challenge. This challenge has been met. These systems are um, very popular. There are many of them that are in um, use right now and they don't leak. So um, these systems uh, at least have, have um, been mastered you might say. So the parabolic trough system. Now um, when you talk about that central tube we can show you a little bit about this by looking at this one. This is actually something from Paul's presentation this afternoon. But you get the idea of what we mean by one of these tubes. Because when you're thinking about light and what you want the sunlight to do, you have a couple of challenges. We know that we like to use a black surface because what? A white surface would be reflective. And the f well, first thing you don't want is for the sunlight to reflect off the outside. If it never gets in, it can't do any good for us. Um, we have another company in Pittsburgh, PPG Industries, um, which is very much involved in how to control the flow of sunlight with coatings. And so we have something that we want to be transparent, so it's glass, right, it's transparent, but it also has to be something which is not reflective. So how you make glass, which is transparent so the sunlight will go through and not reflect off the outside. So you don't want to put an opaque coating on the outside. You want to make sure that you've got something that is transparent and also uh, non-reflective. So the coating goes on on the outside to, to accomplish that. Then you also have a problem because you don't want the heat from the inside to come back out. And normally if you want that to happen, you put something up like aluminum foil or something that's reflective. And so how do we make it uh, so that the uh, radiant heat does not come back out and so another coating needs to go on the inside to prevent that from happening. Now we want the sunlight to be absorbed once it gets through the glass outer coating and so we have the black coating on the inside tube and then um, we need that to allow that heat to pass through easily into the inside where the fluid is and so that has to be a very conductive surface not only absorb well but conduct well so we can get the heat to the inside and in the end we want to make sure that that surface doesn't re-emit uh, radiant heat back into the envelope. So last step of the puzzle is to control conductive heat loss and conductive heat loss remember requires that you be in contact with something and so the interior portion between the outer envelope and the inner envelope is a vacuum. So we don't have any molecules in there to allow the, con the conductance to take place. So very interesting engineering going into the construction of these tubes. But you get the whole idea, right? The evacuation nozzle, we have the vacuum which is going to exist between the outer envelope and the inner envelope. It says we have a steel absorber tube on the inside, so steel good conductor of heat. That we have a glass outer envelope so it's transparent for the sunlight to come through. But we also have different kinds of coatings that are going to be involved to control some of those other aspects. And then it says we have chemical sponges in here because if there's any moisture which gets in there, we want to make sure that it doesn't cause any corrosion. And so the design of our tubes. Well, that's a typical kind of design because again, some of these tubes may involve um, having um, some kind of oily kinds of fluids that would move through there. Um, some of them may have water that goes through there. Um, sometimes the systems can get hot enough that you can get direct conversion of the um, water into steam in the process of moving through the tubes. Um, here's a schematic of you know, a typical um, um, parab uh, parabolic trough system. So we have our solar field out here. We have the fluid moving by virtue of pumps that take it out and um, bring it back into a, a heat exchange process here where um, we're going to create the steam, move the steam over to the turbine, turn the generator to make electricity, and then we have to recover the steam. So um, they're closed systems. 
they require water uh, to initially charge the system, but after that they shouldn't need replacement water in the operation of the system, at least not very much. The other reason you need water is to wash the mirrors every once in a while. And you notice um, that it's true in my little model, but in, in practice the whole thing has to be able to invert so that uh, if there were some kind of a storm, then you want to make sure you can get those mirrors out of the way. But you also want to be able to wash them, so you have to invert them to be able to wash them from time to time. So the challenge, of course, is that these are located in the desert, and how much water are you going to have available to operate the systems? Um, so now we want to talk about the second kind that's called the linear Fresnel reflector system. And you can see right here a really good picture of what we mean by a linear Fresnel system. The big difference, first of all, is that the tube is stationary. The tube does not move with the rotating system. We still are going to track the sun throughout the day. But we're going to do it by virtue of this whole series of mirrors um, that may be curved or may be flat that make up what we call our Fresnel reflector. Now, let me talk just a moment about the Fresnel and what the Fresnel system might involve. Over here is an example of a Fresnel lens. So a lens is a focusing thing, right? And we're used to the idea that a lens would be something with a large curved surface on it. And what they found out was that the lens works by bending the light right at the point where the light passes into the glass. Right at that point, the light gets bent. If the light has to travel through more glass after it crosses the surface, it doesn't make any difference. So if you have a great big lens, you would have a lot of glass underneath the curved surface that isn't doing anything for you. So the concept was, why not eliminate all that extra glass? And so what you do with the Fresnel lens is you take the curved part of the lens and break it up into little pieces. It's like you take your lens and cut it up into sections. And then, with each section, you eliminate any of the glass that isn't involved in the curvature. You take all of those sections and you lay them down onto a surface, a flat surface, and you have all of the little pieces doing the bending as they were doing before, but they're all in the same plane now, and so you have a very compact way of doing that and a much lighter weight way of doing that. So have any of you been to a lighthouse where they've had a demonstration of the old Fresnel lenses that they use in the lighthouse? Some of us get out to the beach this time of year and see some of these old lighthouses. But the idea was to be able to project the light from the lighthouse as far out to sea as possible. And in order to be able to do that, they wanted to use a lens to put a beam of light out there. But in order to get that beam of light as far as possible, you need to make a very big lens. And of course, with a very big lens, it's too much weight. So the solution was to figure out how to make the Fresnel lens so that you get all of the projecting power with virtually, well, very, very small amount of mass associated with it. So that was the lighthouse design. Um, in our design, we're trying to do something different. We're not using a lens, we're trying to use a mirror. So we're taking the lens and reversing it, aren't we? We're trying to gather that light and focus it on a point. So again, you could talk about having a great big trough down here, but why not take that great big trough and lay it down flat and break it up into pieces so that each piece becomes part of that, that reflecting part and focuses the light the same as it would as if we had a continuous parabola down here. So the um, reflector system is much simpler in design, cheaper to construct and actually more effective at focusing the sun. The temperatures that we are achieved in the Fresnel reflector systems are actually um, a bit higher than what we can get in a, a uh, regular uh, trough system. When you look at this picture, you can see a little bit more of the advantage because we have a system over here with a pipe, collector pipe, and a system over here with the collector pipe. And you notice some of the mirrors that are at work down here. And you can see that some of these mirrors over here are going to be focused on this pipe, but some of them are also going to be 
shining over on this pipe. So you get the opportunity to take maximum advantage of shadowing. So if you know, a pipe is going to cause a shadow at some point, and say, well, if this mirror is being shadowed by this pipe, why not turn it and have it focus on this pipe over here? So by manipulating all of the different mirrors at different times of day, we get a little bit more advantage of the sun. Um, so there's a, um, an interesting statement right there. It says, generate superheated seam above 500 degrees Celsius. That's pretty darn hot, isn't it? And that means that they've taken the tubes and put water in them and directly, convert, and directly heated the water to um, that temperature. Still the same idea over here as you can see that we can take the steam generator directly into the steam turbine and um, rather than having that extra step of, of uh, heat conversion that we have in the oil systems. Um, here's the compact linear Fresnel reflector. The same idea on steroids, you might say, so that we put lots of collector pipes in and again, by carefully, carefully maneuvering each of the mirrors, we can heat many pipes at the same time to make a smaller footprint. And so this system can be installed with a lot of power output without taking up as much land as some of the other systems might require. So concentrating solar, the compact linear Fresnel reflector has uh, some of these advantages and disadvantages compared to their standard trough. I'm not going to go in through all of these things, but basically it's a low cost design, a little bit simpler to install, has direct steam conversion. Um, I don't have a good argument for why the linear trough system has been the one of preference. Uh, I don't know if there was... You mean uh, the parabolic? Parabolic mirror, yeah. The um, point is that they're the ones that were the first choice, and I don't know if that's the first technology that was developed or not, but there's a lot of reasons why the, uh, the linear Fresnel system uh, might want to be used in place of the parabolic mirror system. So now I want to talk about a dish system, and this is a little different animal. You can see that it looks different from the very beginning. We have a series of parabolic mirrors now, parabolic dishes, where we're looking not only at you know, the east-west track, but also the north-south track. So we have each of these as an individual standalone unit, which is able to be tracked in all the different axes to keep constantly focused on the sun. Now, why do we do that? because now we're going to put a heat engine into the system. Instead of making electricity with the steam turbine, we're going to make electricity directly from a heat engine which generates mechanical force, which can generate electricity. We'll talk about the Stirling engine a little bit later, um, but fundamentally the Stirling engine just takes heat all of itself and creates mechanical motion. So by putting the Stirling engine up here on the focus of our parabolic dish, we're able to take the heat into the Stirling engine, create electricity directly here. And what's moving out of this field is not heated liquid, but electric current. So the wires connect each one of these things and the electricity itself flows out of the field. So very, very different system and very efficient. Um, so we're going to be able to concentrate the sun much more intensely in this system than we would in the trough system. Another picture, um, a little bit up close, a little bit what this engine might look like as an object, as a box sitting up there. You can't really tell much about it uh, in terms of what that does. Uh, these are the most efficient ways in which to generate electricity from solar thermal energy. and. Um, I have heard it said by Terry Collins, who is the uh, director of the Green uh, Chemistry Institute at Carnegie Mellon University, that he believes that this system is ultimately the solution to our energy problem. That uh, these systems are reliable, um, they are relatively inexpensive, that um, because of their high efficiencies, that they can be very effective at producing electricity. So when he thinks in terms of how we can protect and renew our environment, 
one of the key features is you have to have energy to do it. You have to have lots of energy to do it. And he believes that this system is a system which in the future will be our most reliable system to produce the amounts of energy that we need. Obviously the corollary to that is we have to be able to move that electricity from where we can produce it, which is in the desert, to where we need it. And that requires that we have a revamping of our energy distribution system, our electric grid. And that's something for you to talk about with your students at some point. What exactly do we mean by our grid? And how does it work? And what's wrong with it? And how can it be fixed? Because we need a large national commitment to do that. You know, we talked about the national commitment that we had in the space program. How many dollars we were willing to spend to accomplish a national goal. That's a really important national goal that does not have any cachet associated with it at this point. So nobody's interested in the billions of dollars that it would require to revamp our grid. But it's a really, really important issue and one that you need to know more about and need to help your students know more about. This is another picture of one of these dish systems. Um, not a whole lot to be said here except you'll notice that this engine contains hydrogen gas. So it's a heat engine that is completely contained and it has a gas inside which makes it work. The gas can be air as you'll see in the Stirling engines that you're going to play with later. But the gas could be hydrogen. No reason why it can't be. You say, well, hydrogen's flammable. So what? It's completely sealed. There's no reason to think that the hydrogen would be any more dangerous than working with air. And if it had some engineering reasons why it had some advantages, why not use hydrogen? Notice down here it says they operate at 70 decibels, which is right at which hearing damage may start. So maybe don't want to have one of those next to your house. Another picture of the Stirling engine part of this whole system and a breakdown of some of the different um, design characteristics of one of these units. So now the power tower system, our fourth variation of using solar thermal energy in a concentrated form. So kind of a uh, almost, fut what would you call them, unworldly kind of a, of, a, of a design, huh? When you think about these big towers sticking up and all these mirrors around you, seems like things you've seen in some Star Wars movies or something somewhere along the way. Well, it works in essentially the same way that our other systems do. They concentrate the sun. How? By having a parabolic system. Well, where's the parabolic system? It's the kind of uh, same idea that we had where we have a whole bunch of individual mirrors accomplishing the same goal that a huge dish would accomplish. Well, we couldn't build a dish this size, it would be impossible. But we can get the same ability to collect solar energy over a very wide field and concentrate it all into a single point. But because the field is so large, the focus is very high, and so you have to build a tower and put your collector way up on top of the tower. So all of this sunlight is being concentrated up here. And at that point then we can create very high temperatures and those very high temperatures allow us to do the same thing we were doing before which is generate steam to turn the turbine to make electricity. Some other examples of power towers which have been built in Europe. Um, so one here, a um, little different shape here little different approach to it over here. So nothing particular to recommend one versus the other. This is how they were conceived and different designs that were tried out. Um, now one of the nice things about these systems, and we can start to talk about this a little bit, is the idea of storing the energy. Uh, Janice alluded to that a little bit earlier when she was talking about the need to be able to take energy and put it away from when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing or whatever. When you think about solar panels, you can often have solar panels that are generating electricity that you don't need. And you can think, well, what can I do with that to save it for some other time when I do need it? Well, you can charge a battery. You could pump some water and let the water pump uphill so you could let it run downhill when you wanted it. You could compress air. But those things are not good for huge amounts of electricity. They're good for small amounts of electricity. If you want huge amounts of electricity, you want to be able to come back and generate high temperature steam to turn our turbines the same as we were doing before. 
These systems, these focused concentrating solar systems, allow us to generate temperatures high enough that we can efficiently store energy uh, in a variety of ways. One way is to use a liquid which circulates through the system which we can simply pump into a tank and hold it in the tank, a very well insulated tank, so that the hot liquid can just sit there until we're ready for it. One um, thing that we've discovered is that it says molten nitrate salt. So if you think about something like potassium nitrate, it has a very low melting temperature and once it's melted it's a liquid and can be pumped like any other liquid. As long as that temperature is maintained it'll stay in the liquid state and it has an excellent heat capacity, absorb, ability to absorb heat energy. So we can heat it up, put it in a tank and keep it there for hours and hours. And so we have systems now where these systems can run 24 hours a day. We've, um, it's been a design challenge to get to that point where they could operate 24 hours a day, but we've got systems that are working now which have actually achieved that. So let this thing run in the, in the daytime, and as the day goes by and you have extra energy, why not store it away and wait till the sun to go down and then circulate it back through the system. So this graph here talks a little bit about that. Um, you can see that it, it's a graph of a 24-hour day cycle. And when the sun comes up here, you can see that I've got a lot of solar energy available, but I don't have as much demand yet. And so at that point, why not take all of this energy and store it? Because I don't have a need for it. Then later in the day, when I need it, I can bring it back out of storage so that I can continue to provide power throughout the 24-hour cycle. Pictures of some of these solar thermal storage tanks that look like any other tank because you can't really see the degree of insulation which is being applied um, between the outside and the inside. Um, again, schematic of how this whole thing works in the example of the solar uh, tower system. So we have our solar field out here reflecting all the energy to the solar tower. The solar tower heats the fluid, whatever that working fluid might be. So we're going to heat some salt. It says heated salt. We're going to take that into the hot salt tank and when we want to generate steam, we can run that hot salt to the steam generator, do an energy conversion here, heat the water to steam, use the steam to turn the turbine, recirculate the salt. So we have to be careful that we don't drop the salt to a temperature where it's going to solidify, but just be able to recirculate it through the system. So the solar thermal systems allow us a very um, good way to be able to store energy for when the sun's not shining. <coughs> Again, another example of a schematic vision of how this would all work. Um, so we have the thermal energy storage with the hot salt tank and the cold salt tank. Uh, we circulate the hot salt uh, through the uh, boiler over here to get steamed and make the electricity and um, recirculate the salt back through the system. So concentrating solar power, um, we can talk about systems that exist right now and systems that are being built. Um, we did achieve uh, a day in California recently where um, we got about 2,000 megawatts of electricity out of these solar thermal systems. What does that mean? That means that that was enough electricity to supply 5% of the peak demand in California. So um, about 1.5 million homes uh, were supplied with electricity through that system. Now you say, well, 1.5 million homes is not all the homes in California. Clearly not. Will these systems ever be able to generate enough electricity to produce all the homes in California? Well, they're going to have to be scaled up in order to be able to accomplish that, but certainly making a significant contribution right now. This is a uh, table which talks about operational concentrating solar thermal plants. Now, be careful about mixing data when you start to talk about solar because a lot of solar data is about solar photovoltaics. And when you start to look at this number and say, well, that's not very much, but then when you add solar voltaics to that, it's going to be quite a bit larger and when you add wind to that it's going to be way larger so um, you know it's neat to talk about these numbers but you have to give them context in order for your students to know what they're about. 
This is, as I said, operational. And you'll notice the flags over here. We've got a lot of Spain, don't we? That's what I said. You know, Spain wasn't a great place to do it, but they did it. And they've got a lot of investment in making um, electricity from alternative energy. We have the U.S. plant here online as a parabolic trough system. All these things are parabolic trough systems. Um, this ISCC that it says down there is a little different thing. I don't know I'm going to talk about it right now. Um, but it's kind of a mixed system, different elements to it. This um, talks about things that are under construction, and you see a lot of different kinds of flags in here. Lots of U.S. flags, but Israel, United Arab Emirates, South Africa, India, China, lots of other countries getting involved in these are under construction. So then this next one, uh, we talk about plans for the future. And now you can see we've got some other kinds of uh, systems involved, some towers involved in here, as well as um, some that are not specced out, I guess. One of the big challenges, of course, is that all of this is driven by economics. What is the price that you can sell the electricity for? What is the cost of the construction of a concentrating solar system versus a solar photovoltaic system? You know, should you take your 100 acres of desert and build power tower, or should you put solar panels out there? Well, that's going to be a cost issue, not an engineering issue. They both work. Which one can you do with greater cost efficiency? That's going to be the key. And as long as the cost of silicon cells is so low as it is now, those systems are going to win out over a lot of these concentrating systems. So whether that will continue to be true in the future remains to be seen. But some of these systems that we see on the planning stages here may not get built, or they may. Depends on the economics of the system as we go forward. So some pie charts to make this perhaps a little more intelligible. Concentrating solar. Uh, plants in operation under construction plan. So these are plants in operation. So what portion of them are towers, what portion of them are for now, what portions of them are dish, what portions of them are parabolic troughs. Get that idea. Plants under construction, ones that are planned. And you can see that the Fresnel system perhaps takes a little bit bigger piece of the pie as things move forward. Here's the dish system taking a way big piece of the pie as we move forward. Um, but the parabolic trough is still going to be the dominant player in the system, in the, uh, in the world as these systems are constructed. Utility scale solar projects in the United States. So again, operating under construction, under development, and you talk about total projects in the pipeline. So, you can see that now we're comparing concentrating solar to PV. And again, the concentrating solar is a very small part, 17%, where PV, the regular solar panels, huh, um, are the bigger player. And they expect to continue to be. But as we develop the technology for concentrating solar photovoltaic or concentrating solar power, then we expect that that continue to provide um, an important part in the process. Because remember, the big advantage to these systems is the ability to be able to store the energy. And as that becomes better, as we develop that portion of the technology, then that's going to make concentrating solar a more important player. So solar thermal energy disadvantages, well, obviously you need a lot of space. Ideal locations might not be where the people are, where the um, where the um, grid is located. Mirrors require cleaning and there's a kind of big initial capital cost. But advantages, once you have it built, they produce electricity for very little cost. So um, they work extremely well. Um, they are durable. They don't require a lot of tear down and reconstruction like you would get in um, a coal-fired system, for instance. Um, they create steam that can be used for a lot of different kinds of purposes. So if you don't want to make electricity with it, locate it someplace where you can use that steam for other purposes. And of course, you're going to locate these systems in areas where the land isn't suitable for doing much else with it. So why not? So solar thermal is an important part of our energy mix. And we expect it to continue to be as we move forward. So I know it's kind of a dry technical discussion, but I hope that you got some appreciation for what goes on in solar thermal, high temperature solar thermal usage. <laughs>